Chapter 315 The Enslaved Bride, Part 12 When Malwal and Olivia met again, and revealed the results of their search to each other, they found themselves being confronted by a new problem, what was the next step? It was Malwal who began to doubt the existence of Ian. He concluded that Ian must probably have perished with her family on that fateful day. Unwillingly, Olivia accepted his conclusion. What is our next step? asked Olivia. We have to leave this accursed city and go somewhere else, replied Malwal, packing his personal items back into his small bag. What about your trip to the States? Olivia had a hard time making eye contact. She continued, you have to return to your home. Malwal's hands were still for a moment. And, what about you? Where will you go? I am a free girl, like a bird in the sky. I can fly anywhere, build a nest and rest, said Olivia, trying to smile. And who is the lucky guy who is going to share that nest with you and enjoy your love forever? Malwal realized this question mattered to him very much. God knows, said Olivia shyly, looking at him from under lowered lashes. Malwal had a sparkle in his eyes and kept staring at her for a few moments. Finally, he said, remember, you told me one day in the jungle that for every eve God created an atom. Olivia found herself being trapped by her own words. She covered her beautiful eyes with long fingers and laughed. Still giggling, she asked, and who is my Adam? It's me, Olivia. Malwal had moved up close to his dearest friend and held out one imploring hand. Yes, Olivia, you have become everything in my life. I did not know what love really was until I met you. Oh Malwal, breathed Olivia still covering her face with her hands, you are a married man. How can I think of marrying you, when we are not yet sure whether Ian is alive or dead? Malwal spoke gently, his heart full. We have done what we could do. There is nothing else left for us to do. He wished Olivia would look at him. As if she had heard his thoughts, Olivia uncovered her eyes, looked straight at him and asked what we shall do if we discover one day that I am still alive. Her eyes were full of unshed tears. Olivia, we are in love, and there is nothing that can stop us from being together. Malwal reached for Olivia's hand and caressed it with both of his thumbs. Olivia lifted Malwal's chin with her other hand. You have not answered my question. I have no answer for your question. Malwal felt, as though he would burst. So full of joy was he. Neither have I an answer, except my love for you. Olivia spoke softly, nearly touching Malwal's face with hers. I love you too, Olivia, said Malwal and his lips joined Olivia's lips. Malwal and Olivia got married a week later. They spent their first wedding night in a beautiful hotel in El Fasher City, before they went on their honeymoon. It was Olivia's lifelong dream to see the famous, picturesque mountain of Mera. Her Arab boyfriend had put that dream in her heart before he died in the war. Malwal was the one who came all the way from America to fulfill that dream. What happened between the two lovers in their first wedding night was beyond description. The two thirsty souls were at last able to drink from the fountain of their love, and their thirst was satiated. The next morning, Olivia and Malwal woke up feeling like different people. The morning sun shone on two united souls. Their honeymoon began that day. They travelled to Jebel Mera and lived among unique people. At that high elevation, people became equal. There was no difference between Tia and Abdullah, African and Arab, Southerner and Northerner, Muslim and Christian, and slave and master up in the fresh air. When the visitors climbed the mountain, all dividing barriers were removed. The newly married couple, Malwal and Olivia, enjoyed the most wonderful week of their lives. When their honeymoon was over, they returned to El Fasher. They decided to take a train from El Fasher to Kosti and from there to join the ship, which sails to the south. Their plan was to travel to Kenya, and from there, back to the States. But, 
things did not work out as they had planned. After the British left Sudan in 1956, any major social or political changes were initiated by the students. The blood of the martyrs at Khartoum University flowed in the streets of the capital city and all the other major cities in Sudan, in the October Revolution that became the country's pride in 1964. Later on, many political and religious parties claimed to be the real heroes of October Revolution. It was always like that in Sudan, the students caused the sham ashes of the streets to rise up against social injustice and dictatorial regimes, and then the political and religious parties came and messed up everything again. They would drag the society back to a worse state than what it was before the revolution. After many years of living under dictatorship, genocide and nepotism, the students would revolt again and kick out the corrupt leadership. The circle kept on repeating itself, until the present Islamic regime of Umar al-Bashir came into power. At least the previous bad regimes did not sanction jihad and slavery like this present one. The students in El Fasher began a new revolt, and moved out into the streets of the city. The police in Sudan were allowed to shoot and kill anyone who raised objections to the regime, except for the students. All the dictators who came after the October Revolution learned a lesson from the mistake of the former Sudanese dictator Ibrahim Aboud. Aboud's government was known as the government of the Seven Cowboys. One of those seven made a proposal to the parliament to pour kerosene on the bushes and jungles of southern Sudan and burn every living creature that lived there there, humans and animals. The other members of the parliament accepted his proposal, and a date was scheduled for the genocide of the poor southerners. Before the evil plan could be carried out on the innocent Sudanese people, the students of Khartoum University revolted. The same cowboy who came up with the satanic plan ordered the police and the military forces to open fire on the unarmed students. The bullets of the soldiers and policemen killed many innocent students that day. This led the people of Khartoum to rise up against the brutality of the government, and the first revolution in the country was born on the memorable day of October 21. 1964. Ever since, no dictator had ever repeated that same mistake by shooting the students. The policemen were allowed to beat them with sticks and kick them with their boots, but never to open fire on them. When the school's students remembered the case of Mualana Abdul Razak, after the excitement of the fire diminished, they began a protest. The sham ashes of the city joined the students and moved through the streets to the house of Mualana. This time, the people showered the residents of the imam with stones and bricks. The mayor of the city came to the scene and promised the protesters that he would bring Mualana to justice very soon. The people did not stop their revolt until the mayor gave them a date for the trial. Mualana was promptly scheduled to appear before the criminal court in one week's time. On the same day the students and the sham ashes stoned the residents of the imam, Malwal, and his lovely bride returned from their honeymoon. The newly wedded couple joined the mob and took part in the protest, but were not satisfied with the results of the revolt. They understood that the public and the government officially denounced slavery but the hidden captivity of Sudanese such as the Baramilos, the Janjaid victims, the farm workers and Bit al Zabiyar's prostitutes was tolerated. In any case, the two friends decided to stay behind and attend the trial of Mualana Abdul Razak. In her short message to them, Ikhlas had indicated to Malwal and Olivia that she was a poor girl, who had no parents or shelter. Therefore, the newly wedded couple decided to appoint a lawyer on her behalf, to defend her case. They did not trust judges or jurymen who were Arabs to bring justice to a southerner. For that reason, they approached a lawyer from the south who was neither an Arab nor a Muslim. Whatever the cost might be, they decided to cover it. Under pressure from the central government, the trial was rescheduled for a working day. The government wanted to reduce the number of the spectators, to avoid any social troubles. Moreover, the court authority was given a small hall in which to conduct its hearing. It was announced, that as soon as the hall was full, the doors would be closed. Those citizens who failed to get admitted into the courtroom, would have to return to their homes and watch the trial on their TVs or hear it on their radios. Mr. Aldali, the MP who took the case to court, 
appointed a lawyer to fight against Mu Alan as legal representative. This time, the court notified Ikalas that her presence was necessary, and that without her, the trial would not be conducted. Mu Alana objected, saying that he would not allow his jaria to appear in front of the men in court and speak, because she was awara and her voice was awara, which means naked and taboo. According to the Prophet of Islam woman is awara, which means she is all naked even if she is dressed up. He said even her voice is naked and for that reason she is not supposed to appear before men or speak to them. Nevertheless, the court rejected his excuse, and threatened to apply force in order to bring the girl into court. When he failed to stop Ikhlas from appearing before the court, Mu'alana forbade her lawyers from contacting her at his house. As we mentioned, without her knowledge two lawyers, an Arab and an African, had been appointed to represent her in court. The plaintiff, Mr. Aldali, appointed the first lawyer. Against his wish, Mu'alana Abdul Razik was assigned an advocate by his son-in-law, Mr. Al Saab. On the appointed day, Malwal and Olivia came to the court building before the sunrise and stood in a long queue. No long after their arrival, the court doors were opened, and the people began to force their way into the hall. Malwal and Olivia were lucky enough to get seats in the first row of benches. They waited for four hours before the trial started at 10 a.m. A few minutes before the trial, Mu'alana and his legal representative entered the court, followed by a southern girl. If it had not been for his legal robe, Malwal and Olivia might have mistaken the legal representative for Mu'alana himself. He had a long beard and was dressed up in a black robe. He carried a stick in his right hand, as did Mu'alana, and a copy of the Koran in his left hand. Their religious appearances reminded the couple of some faces they saw, every now and then, on the TV channels in Sudan. Even though Ikhlas's entire body was enveloped in an Islamic hijab like an onion, her face still revealed her beauty and young age. In her beautiful eyes, the audience could see subjugation and suffering. Ikhlas walked behind Mu'alana, carrying her baby daughter on her shoulder. Although Malwal and Olivia had never seen Ikhlas before, they knew it had to be her. They fixed their gaze on her marvelous beauty. Her big eyes glittered like the stars on a dark night. Her black skin shone, due to the dilka rubbed on her face. Her lips were slightly bigger than average. She was tall and possessed a lovely figure. Her sari was blue and decorated with gold silk embroidery. She looked tense and frightened. The two lovers were able to penetrate behind her fears and tension and see what she might have been before she fell into slavery. She seemed as though she could have been the daughter of a great chief or a sultan in the south. Her eyes still revealed the memories of her golden days, when she was among her people and free like a deer. Those days of pride and honor were hidden beneath the layers of slavery and abuse she had been subjected to. She now looked frightened, like a person who mistrusted everyone around her. A policeman directed her to a seat near Mu'alana Abdul Razik. Even after she had been seated in close proximity to her abuser, she continued to look down, like a bride brought before the audience. Olivia and Malwal's eyes flooded with tears, when they saw such a young and beautiful southerner sitting near a man who claimed to be her master and owner, who was old as her grandfather. Was this what it would have been when the Prophet Muhammad was fifty-four and sat near his bride Aisha? who was six years old. The court began the trial with a brief summary of the case. It recorded the lawsuit Mr. Aldali had previously brought against Mu'alana Abdul Razik. Everything read in that brief was common information to the audience. The judge asked Mu'alana's lawyer to present his defense. Everyone in the court was surprised when they saw the big, green file the lawyer pulled out of his suitcase. It looked bigger than the copy of the Quran Mu'alana was still carrying in his hand. The audience was worried that the lawyer might read the entire file. They would rather hear a recital of the entire Quran than listen to that huge file being read in the court. The lawyer stepped forward, and stood between the jury and the audience. Before he opened his green file, he thanked Allah, the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet's companions, 
the four rightly guided caliphs who ruled after the Prophet, and all the blessed posterity of Islamic leaders and scholars who followed in history. Then, he opened his file, and his mouth, and began to read loudly to the court. Your Honor the Judge, the revered jury, and everyone here who follows the guidance of Islam. I have many things to read to you today, but before that, I would like to ask Allah and his Prophet to make everything I say clear and understandable. I am aware of the fact that many people in this court have little knowledge of the law of this country. I thank Allah that most of the audience in this courtroom are Muslims, and understand their beautiful religion of Islam. I have no doubt that the presiding judge, and his jury, are well versed in the Quran, Islamic Sharia and the laws of this country. The lawyer paused, walked towards the judge, took a cup of water, which had been placed in front of his honor, and took a quick sip from it. He thanked Allah and his Prophet again, then retreated to his former position. The entire audience continued to look at the judge, waiting to see whether the lawyer was supposed to drink from the same cup his majesty had drunk from a few seconds previously. When no sign of discomfort or annoyance surfaced on his face, the audience shifted their gazes back to the lawyer. The case of Mu'alana Abdul Razik versus this woman, Ikhlas, sounded like a story of the past, learned in history or religious classes at school, to everyone who heard it. No one today would expect such a story to involve real people. Well, it happened, and the persons involved are now here, sitting in this courtroom. The lawyer waved towards the area where Mu'alana and Ikhlas were seated. The tales, like this, which we read in school, we did not judge to be unlawful or immoral. Why? Because it is permissible in Islam, and the religions of the heavenly books that came before it, for a man to sleep with his concubines or slave women. Islam has never forbidden the Muslim man to have sexual intercourse with his jewelry, no matter how many of them, or how many times. That is why the Sharia court could not condemn my client. If they had condemned him, then they would have had to condemn the Prophet of Islam himself, who started this blessed Sunnah. The judge interrupted this discourse by leaning forward, hitting his gavel on the sounding bell, and saying, Will you please keep it brief, and come to the main point? Please remember that in this court, we do not judge the accused according to what the Quran said or the Prophet did, but we follow the Sudanese law and everyone breaks that law will be tried accordingly. The lawyer and his client had been expecting such a confrontation and hence, were well prepared for it. Well, 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 said the lawyer, with big smile on his face, I knew that sooner, or later, the court was going to bring the problem of the Sudanese law versus the Islamic law. My client and I know that, in this court, the Sharia laws have no bearing. We also know that this court follows the British law, the Indian law, and some old Sudanese customs and traditions. I would be a fool to accept a case that cannot be defended in this court. I will be brief and come straight to the main question. What the lawsuit has mentioned against my client is false. It is not true that Mu'alana Abdul Razik has impregnated Ikhlas out of the marriage bond. She was his lawful wife when he slept with her and she is his wife until this moment. The judge put down his gavel, and waited for the lawyer to explain his shocking statement. Some people in the audience lifted their bodies a few inches above their seats, and shook themselves to make sure that what they were seeing and hearing was real. This girl, continued the lawyer with a loud voice, has a father by the name of Abdullah Deng. He was a Christian southerner, who embraced Islam at the feet of Mu'alana Abdul Razik. Ikhlas too embraced Islam, along with her father. Mr. Abdullah Deng is a big sultan in the south and has great wealth. He has over 200,000 cows and many other properties as well as gold. When he embraced Islam, some other chiefs in the Dinka land heard about him and decided to punish him, by confiscating everything he owns. This conspiracy reached the ears of Mr. Abdullah while he was learning the Quran in El Fashir. He decided to return to the south immediately and fight against those bad chiefs who had stolen his cows and possessions. He was not sure whether he was going to win or lose the battle. 
Nevertheless, as a man of courage and principles, he determined to go. Before his departure, he left his daughter with Mu'alana Abdul Razak as a manna on his neck. Mu'alana took Ikhlas into his house, and treated her as one of his daughters. In the course of time, Mu'alana saw some good qualities in Ikhlas, and decided to marry her. Because he already had four wives in his possession, the Islamic law would not permit him to do that. He consulted his first wife, who was very old by then and had lost her desire for men. This wife had lived with Mu'alana for a long time, and found it difficult to separate herself from him. As Sada bint Zaymar requested the Prophet to keep her, and gifted her knight to his beloved wife Aisha, so this wife requested Mu'alana to keep her, and gifted her knight to his new wife Ikhlas. She made Mu'alana promise that he would not reveal her divorce to any of his other women. This was because she thought the other wives would rejoice in her divorce, and make fun of her. My client, being a man of large heart and dignity, accepted the deal, and kept the matter to himself and Allah. Here is a copy of the marriage contract, and in this court I now present the three witnesses who attested to the contract and added their signatures to it. What Mu'alana's lawyer had said about his client was called the Takiyya in the Islamic Sharia. The Takiyya law was based on a hadith attributed to the Prophet, in which the Muslim man was allowed to lie in certain cases if his life was in danger, if he lived in a country where Islam was not the main religion, or if he was brought into a court where Islamic laws were not followed. Under any situation when Islamic laws and non-Islamic laws came into conflict the Muslim man was permitted to practice Takiyya. The Takiyya in fact was meant to honor the laws of Allah and his Prophet, and gave open permission to lie. Well, 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 said the judge, laughing, if that is exactly what has happened, then why did your client lie to the public and the Sharia court? Was it because he wanted to honor and reward his first wife for her loyalty and long stay with him? That is one of the reasons, but not the main one, said the lawyer, lifting his hand as if he was in a classroom. The lawyer kept his hand in the air for a long time, and looked around to make sure that every pair of eyes was focused on him. The main reason is that Mu'alana wanted to honor Islam, and revive the blessed Sunnah of the Prophet. He wanted to show the Muslim community that we live in a time where Islam has become weak, the laws of Allah have been ignored, and man-made laws rule the Muslims. He wanted to Stop! shouted the judge holding up his right hand and closing his eyes. Stop, stop! If you wish to finish your sermon, please go to the mosque. The court has to verify what you have said about the marriage contract between the accused and Ikhlas. The judge waited for a while before he put his hand down and opened his eyes. When he became sure that the sounding bell was silenced, by placing his hand on it, he continued to speak. I invite Mrs. Ikhlas Abdullah Deng to come forward and confirm, or deny what has been said about her marriage to Mu'alana Abdul Razak. When Ikhlas stood, a dead silence ensued in the court. One could only hear the noise of the flies, moving from one person to another. Ikhlas was shaking and sweating when she stood before his honor. She could not open her mouth to speak until the judge led her in a brief session of questions and answers. Did you know that you were lawfully wedded to Mu'alana Abdul Razak before he slept with you? Yes, I did, said Ikhlas in a low voice. The judge repeated the question again and asked her to answer it more loudly. When she answered in the affirmative, he asked her another question. Have you been treated as a married woman or a slave girl in Mu'alana's house? As a married woman. Were you forced to marry Mu'alana or wed of your own free will? My own free will. Ikhlas stood straight as a tree, her face pale. Have you been forced to convert to Islam? The judge lowered his glasses and stared at the young woman. No. He was running out of questions. Where is your father now? In the south. Murmurs had begun to spread throughout the courtroom by this time. The judge raised his voice and said, Thank you, Ikhlas. You may return to your seat. The judge waited until Ikhlas had returned to her seat, 
and then said, the door is now open for the two other lawyers to present their cases. The northern lawyer rose to his feet and said, I have prepared more than 30 pages to fight this case. With one stroke the defense lawyer has nullified everything I have written. If it is true that Mualana Abdul Razak lawfully married the daughter of Mr. Abdullah Deng, then I have no choice but to sit down, and shut my mouth. Before I do, I request the court to call upon the three witnesses and ask them to confirm the marriage contract. Will the three witnesses come forward and confirm the marriage contract under oath, said the judge. Mualana's terrorist son-in-law, and two other citizens came to the front as witnesses. What attracted the attention of the audience, and made them laugh, was the appearance of the other two witnesses who accompanied Mr. Alsab. One of them looked as if he had died many years previously, and someone exhumed him before bringing him to the courtroom. He must have lived nearly a century and staggered along, supported by the other two. His human crutches clutched his arms for fear that he might topple at any moment and pass again into eternity. His five senses and mental faculties had ceased to function, besides which, he was insane. Though his body was supported like an old hut by the other two witnesses still he was about to fall off any moment. The other two witnesses supported him in fear and much care, afraid that he might melt out of their hands and fall on the floor and break his neck and die, then the court might count him a living human being and held them responsible for killing him. Eyes had, but he could not see ears had, but could not hear, nose had, but could not smell, legs had, but could not walk, and brain had, but could not function. The third witness looked like a more savory character than the other two. Everyone present knew who he was and merely laughed when they saw him. He worked as a witness at the civil and the sharia courts. Every day this man would visit both courts, standing in front of the gate ready to hire as a false witness. If a woman needed a witness to bear false testimony against her neighbor, he would do it, for the right price. If a man coveted someone's donkey and took it away, this man would testify, swearing on the Book of Allah, that the donkey was born and raised in the thief's house. That day, those three witnesses placed their right hands on the Holy Quran and bore witness to the authenticity of the marriage contract. Mr. Al Saab lifted the fleshless hand of the second witness onto the Quran, then someone shouted in his deaf ear, Have you witnessed the marriage between Mualana Abdul Razak and Ikhlas Abdullah Deng? He made a gesture, which the court counted as consent.